everyone for your patience. Um, trying things with technology often means that it doesn't go quite as planned, but I think from here, we should be all set. So I'm excited to see uh, many of you again from yesterday. So our faculty members were with us yesterday to talk about a lot of different elements of course design. Welcome to community partners who are either joining us today or in the future uh, by watching the recording. Um, we're excited to have everybody here today and really dive a little bit more into what makes for quality community partnerships in courses. And it's really meant to launch your conversation with a community partner, again, whether that's today or if that's in the future when you're able to meet. Want to really give you some background from literature, but also from a recent study that we did here in Iowa about what community partner perceptions are of working with higher education, um, that we hope will give you some of that community partner voice as you think about how you want to approach this. So as we think about this, the goal is really to have authentic community partnerships. Um, there are really four different elements that kind of go into that. One is looking at guiding principles, which we'll go through. Um, one thing that's really important is quality processes. Like most things that involve relationships, the process is often more important than the um, outcome in some cases. So really thinking about what your partnership process will be is very important. Of course, meaningful outcomes are important as well in terms of really having conversation from the beginning about what meaningful outcomes would be to each side of the equation and not assuming that. Um, so again, for on the higher education side, that's likely to be student learning outcomes, um, student impact outcomes, potentially research outcomes, or the faculty member have, may have their own personal outcomes. On the community side, that can mean lots of different things. So we had some conversation about this yesterday, just in terms of how you might measure community impact. And what I usually recommend with that is that that's a conversation. Um, often what students are contributing is a small piece of a larger pu puzzle. So the community partner will have the best sense of how that impact could be understood, perhaps measured, that's not always an option. But the most important thing is taking some step to evaluate on each side whether those outcomes were achieved um, that everyone was looking for. And the final thing is really thinking about transformative experiences. So that's experiences where the process transforms. So again, as we discussed yesterday, going into the conversation knowing learning outcomes might change, project outcomes might change, and really being, being willing to transform your thinking through that conversation and that kind of thing. But also thinking about deeper transformation of students, of organizations, of clients, just lots of different things. And I'll go into that in a little more detail as well. So first, there are some uh, good guiding partners, guiding principles from Community Campus Partnerships for Health. And they've really done a lot of the foundational work around thinking about what a partnership means and the things you should be taking into account. So some things to think about that there's a specific purpose, right? You're going into the conversation saying, we're gonna plan a project around this one semester, or maybe it's more ongoing, encompasses several semesters or one small piece, um, but you're really specific about what it is you're thinking about doing. Again, you agree on what you're trying to achieve and the values of that. And I think that values conversation is really important, um, especially if you're working with an organization where um, you know, they will, they have clients from a vulnerable population, that kind of thing. There may be times where, again, those relationships, the interaction with the client supersedes the desired outcome. And so really talking about what those values are that will guide your work, that may also be values you have of, for your students, um, things you want to make sure do and don't happen with them. Um, building mutual trust, respect, genuineness, commitment. Again, lots of these things are about building an actual relationship. And so that's something that really want to emphasize because it is so important to success that that occurs when it can, and that takes time. Building a relationship is just something that means you spend time with another person. So really thinking about how that might happen. Um, identifying strengths and assets on both sides. Um, again, really thinking of how community partners can play a role as co-educators. Um, as we learned in our study and have seen in many examples, that's often a goal that community partners have from being involved in the project is that they 
want to be involved in the education of students, whether that's a personal interest of theirs or it's a passion they have because they care about their issues so much and want students to know about that. Um, there may be many reasons for that, but that's often a goal and, and really something that can, should be discussed. Um, something that's really important is thinking about the balance of power. And it's really, that piece is very much incumbent on the higher education partners. Um, colleges and universities are very powerful influences in any community and state. And so we've, again, learned from our study and uh, other research and conversation that often community partners feel like they can't say no to the college or university when they're asking to partner, when they're asking for something for students, whatever the case may be. So being clear on the front end about that that you can say no making sure you're trying to give power to the community partner is really important all of that kind of links back to having really clear open and frequent communication lots of opportunities for feedback um, establishing how you're going to work together and really talking about that sometimes that might mean you want to have an actual written agreement that's something that some partnerships choose to do um, doesn't always need to be that formal but really deciding and um, really working through any assumptions that you might have about who's going to be where or who's going to do what or what things are going to look like um, of course making sure the benefits are shared whatever that may look like and having a plan for closure. And that's really important too, because you wanna make sure you're not setting up something that leaves a community organization with a gap at the end of the semester, right? Something that gets going and then the students leave for the Christmas break or the summer and the community partner has to somehow figure out how to make that happen. And that kind of goes back to, you know, um, I guess getting outside of your own higher ed bubble in that, Community organizations don't necessarily know uh, some, the semester time frame, or that students do leave in the summer or that kind of thing. They're not necessarily going to know exactly what um, time frame you're working with and what the ins and outs of that are. They also aren't going to know your jargon. <laughs> so <laughs> please avoid that. Don't use the acronyms for your college, um, things like that. That can be very, again, colleges and universities are seen as powerful, also can be intimidating. So anything you can do to um, address that and how you talk and interact and and that kind of thing in authentic ways I think is really important so quality processes really goes back to again getting to know the person uh, being really open to learning about the skills and assets of them and their organization being really clear in conversations about what everyone's role is going to be um, making sure people get what they want out of it in lots of ways. So again, sometimes you may want as a faculty member an experience learning more about a community organization and being involved in them yourself, in their, in their work yourself. And again, the community partner may be looking for not more knowledge and information about how teaching works, that kind of thing, or they may not. Again, talking about what leadership and skill experiences folks wanna have is important. Identifying resources either that you have or that may be needed and talking about that. Again, um, maybe a partnership agreement, um, at least kind of jotting down uh, what you're agreeing to. I know for, for my sake, I forget things that happen in conversations a fair amount. So even just summarizing, here's what I think we decided, that kind of thing can be really helpful. And then very important, I think, is establishing a plan for regular communication. It is often the case that despite our best intentions, once the semester gets going, all of that kind of falls away and all of a sudden it'll be a month before the semester ends and you haven't talked in a while and you're not really sure what's going on. Especially if the students are gonna be interacting with the community partner without you there as a faculty member, which is often the case. Uh, making sure that regular plan for communication is there so that there's accountability, so that you can learn and understand what's going on and be able to um, give students feedback in, in class times and different things like that throughout that process and that you have that information. So thinking about meaningful outcomes, um, one framework for that from a recent uh, research piece was really around this idea of give and get. So having a conversation about what the college and university partner will give 
what the community partner will give and what each side will get. Now that's a little bit transactional and we're going to talk in a little bit about some different ways of thinking about that. But again, recognizing that each side of the partnership is giving and getting and really being clear about what you would like to see happen and really thinking about do those things balance out. So for example, a community partner may be willing to come to your class a few times, talk about their organization, um, help to lead reflections. They may be more likely to do that if their organization is getting a pretty substantial benefit. They may be less likely to be interested in doing that if their organization is getting a couple of volunteer hours. So again, making sure that you're really talking about whether those things seem like a good fit and it seems like there's a good balance there, whatever that looks like to those involved. Um, another kind of framework from the literature is really thinking about transactional versus transformative relationships. This is really not to say that transformative is the gold standard. It's really to look at this as a continuum and realize that um, transactional, and we definitely learned this from the study, sometimes all a community partner is looking for is a transactional relationship. You know, I, I need uh, five volunteers on a Saturday, you want students to interact with my clients, that's what we're going to do here. Um, it's not necessarily the case that every partnership needs to be this big transformative thing, but it is an important framework to think about just in terms of trying to figure out what you think um, would be good, or if you're partnership ends up being able to be something that's more long term, would you think about moving along that continuum as you get to know each other, as your interactions actually change each other, um, and that kind of thing. So again, it's really moving from something that's about, I'm in this place, you're in this place, let's figure out what we can exchange to let's really together change what we're trying to do and build something together. Um, and you can see here the different uh, criteria that might go into thinking about what you're going for. So again, a lot of it comes down to the, the scope of the commitment. If you have limited time and resources, you may not want to or be able to move much beyond transactional. That can be fine if that's what everybody has agreed it is. Um, but you may want to move further than that, um, you know, as you see benefits, are able to commit more time, that kind of thing. So it's just a different way of thinking about it. So one thing I always like to mention in the context of partnership is this idea of um, really thinking and talking about student preparation. And when I talk about the study, you'll see more of why I'm emphasizing this because it did come up in the study quite a bit as something community partners have a lot of concerns about. So there are a couple of different ways of thinking about preparing students for the project. One is for the service site or the organization, you know, again, Students may or may not be going physically to um, an organization, their space, anything like that, but it's still really important they have background on that organization, their issues, um, their staffing. I'll mention their staffing specifically because one thing I've seen before is, for example, students writing a social media plan for an organization, right? Um, great social media plan, except they did not really recognize or understand that the organization has one staff person. So the social media plan they wrote is really not something that organization could ever adopt because of that staffing reality. So I do think that it's really important students have that opportunity to get the context and background um, of the organization, their community, that kind of thing. In some cases, especially again, if they are going to the site, that's also conversations about the policies of that organization. Risk management, confidentiality, there may be background check processes. If, you, if there are background check processes and you don't talk about that till the semester gets started, your project is likely not to happen. So those are really important conversations to have early. Um, other expectations, around behavior, dress, again, you may be dealing with students who haven't ever had a professional workplace situation or haven't been to a certain type of organization. So over explaining, over communicating the expectations, talking through even things you think somebody should just know to do. Um, also because you'll have students coming from different cultural, cultural backgrounds and things like that. So 
not making any assumptions that they will know that they have to be on time, that they will know they shouldn't wear a mini skirt, you know, whatever the case may be, making sure those things get communicated. The other one that's really important we, that we kind of touched on yesterday is especially if students are going to be, you know, working with an, a specific issue area or a, a different type of population than they may know about, making sure they have that time to really um, reflect on their assumptions and stereotypes, do research on the larger context, like we kind of talked about with the library partnerships yesterday, that they really are as prepared as they can be for for those encounters and that kind of thing and not just kind of thrown in. That might work on the other side as well. One of the things that we've seen more and more is we have predominantly white organizations and students of color coming to work with those organizations. And those organizations or their clients may not have had a lot of interactions with people of color. So what are the potential, um, what's the preparation that may need to occur on both sides so that interactions can as much as possible be um, be positive or at least be something we can learn from, that kind of thing. So again, some way of, th so of thinking about that can be simple as stu having students do some pre-reflection so that they're um, thinking about what they expect and why they expect that and that kind of thing. Pre-readings, research, you know, again, really putting the ball in their court to, to look into and learn about the organization or the issue, discussions in class. There are lots of different ways to think about it, but it's really important to make sure that that's built into your timeline for the class so that there is time for those kinds of things to occur um, and really hopefully sink in in some way with students before they're engaging with the partner or that kind of thing. So I wanted to take a minute to share the community partner study that we recently completed. It was just released in February of this year. Um, and we spent about six months on the study. Um, we really wanted to know how community organiza how community-based organizations in Iowa specifically perceive partnerships with institutions of higher education. Um, there have been a few other studies along these lines, one in California, one in Wisconsin, um, and we really did build on the findings of those. So we were looking to build the knowledge of the field about what about the voice of community partners in this work, but also get some specific Iowa context to that. So we surveyed 310 nonprofit staff. Um, nearly all of them already had partnerships with uh, institutions of higher education. Many had partnerships with more than one institution of higher education. So that was an interesting finding as well. Um, we had, we from the survey did four focus groups uh, in three different locations all across the state. And then with a, yeah, four focus groups, three different locations, and then a fifth virtual option because we definitely wanted to make sure to, meet, to reach folks in rural areas or parts of the state that we um, weren't able to have a focus group. So we had 40 participants in those from 39 different organizations. So we kind of had two parts to, the, to that study, the findings and then um, after looking at those findings, the recommendations that we decided to make um, as an organization with our researcher. So uh, first, the findings. One, that successful partnerships require a solid foundation. So again, that's a lot of how we've, the reason we've set up this institute the way we have, really encouraging those community partner meetings to happen early and often. Um, making sure that, that those conversations early are happening, that the foundation is being built before things get started. Another is that um, it's really important to effectively manage student experiences. So that's where we think about preparation, but it's also where we think about structure and making sure that all of those things are there um, to maximize the outcomes for everyone involved. The third, unsurprisingly, is that investing time and capacity is really difficult, both on the higher education and the community partner side. Um, it's not necessarily that people don't know they should spend time building a relationship and working on things together, it's that there are lots of barriers to that occurring. Um, there's just, there's a lot of time pressures on both sides of that equation that make that very difficult to do. A quote from the study that kind of speaks to this um, that I love is from a, from a, a 
study participant who really talked about sometimes we rush rush the dating period of the partnership. We really, you know, that we kind of meet a potential partner and we get really excited about it right away and don't necessarily take the time to pause and think about it and see if it's really going to be a good fit and have those early conversations and see if we're two people who can work well together, see if we have some of the same goals and really think about whether that makes sense um, in both of our contexts to do that partnership. So a couple of the other findings, um, one, that partnerships exist between individuals. This may seem obvious, but in the literature and in how we talk about partnerships, we talk about partnerships as between Iowa State and the Volunteer Center. Um, Co-College and Willow State Homeless Shelter. We talk about partnerships as though they're between institutions or organizations. The reality is that they're, uh, they're between individuals and so individual relationships really guide their success or failure. So we can do all the great things in the world to say here's what makes for a great partnership and do all these great things, but at the end of the day if those two people can or don't want to work together, it's going to fail. So really making sure that that happens um, and I'll talk a little bit about part of what we think that means in terms of how we approach this. And then another thing to keep in mind is that community-based organizations continue to find navigating higher education very difficult. And so I think if you establish a partnership, it's about that course um, and what you're trying to do together, but it's also about maybe you being a navigator for them, thinking about how they might build other partnerships with your institution, that kind of thing. And there, and there are some other things we think institutions can do on this front that I'll get to in a second, but I think that's really important to um, understand. So another um, just quote from the study that I thought uh, highlighted some of what we've talked about is um, that community partners really do see these partnerships as being about enhancing learning and real life experiences for students. Again, yes, want benefits for their organization, but also often see real value in being a part of that. So I think that's important to remember, again, that that is a benefit and that they see that it's a reason for, so for a community partner, you can take volunteers from lots of sources, right? You may have volunteers from a local faith-based organization, or you might have volunteers from a neighborhood or retired volunteers or, you know, across the board. Why college student volunteers, right? That's a real question in some cases. And in many cases, this is why, that they want students who might be living in their communities to get real life experiences with the issues they're dealing with. They also might want students to see that their community is a place they would wanna live, right? I think in a lot of places in Iowa, the interaction is about, I want them to see that this is a great place and consider staying here and that kind of thing. So again, there are lots of these benefits that we don't necessarily talk about that we saw come up a lot in this study. So from these, um, findings, we created a few different recommendations. Some of these will be more relevant to you as an individual instructor than others, because some of them are really more institution-wide things to be considering, but they are also things you can advocate for in your campus. So a big one is focusing on quality over quantity. When the reality is that partnerships are successful if, if, if you invest time in the relationship and no one has enough time, the answer is fewer partnerships. The only way to really do that is to <clears throat> invest more time in a, few, in a smaller number of partnerships. So that's thinking, thinking about how you structure your course. That's one way to think about it. It's something for um, higher ed as a whole to think about in terms of the number of partnerships the institution is taking on, but it's also something for community-based organizations to think about. And so that's something, again, really making sure organizations feel empowered to say, I can't take the, I can't invest in another partnership right now um, and say no and that kind of thing and really be a little more discerning about that, I think is important. Um, also on both sides, organizational infrastructure dedicated to partnerships is really important. So in higher education, we really advocate for that sort of um, centralized support uh, for helping to establish and sustain partnerships. Um, on the higher ed side, the same is true because having staff dedicated to volunteer management is often a challenge for um, 
nonprofit organization. So then it's a challenge. You may be working with a program staff member who is supposed to be spending most of their time implementing that program, not managing volunteers. So that can be a, a difficulty on both sides. Um, again, strengthening student preparation and accountability is very important. Um, making sure that students are prepared, but also making sure that again, you know whether they're living up to the expectations and they know whether they're living up to the expectations. So making sure that feedback is built in so that that can occur. Um, we need to hold students to a higher standard in a lot of cases. And I think that it's really important that we help them understand that when we are doing a community engaged project, it's not hypothetical. Your, what you're contributing matters to someone. Someone is counting on that. Someone has invested time in getting that thing. So I think the more we can do to help students to see and understand that, but also to build in accountability and build ways to make sure that even if a few students don't um, meet their expectations, the community partner can still get something meaningful. Um, so again, kind of building that reality in from the beginning. Another key recommendation for us was really to shift from this idea of reciprocity into co-creation. So again, one of the things we found is that community partners aren't necessarily super focused on making sure that what they're going to get matches what they're giving perfectly. We see a lot of interest in, in being co-educators. We see a lot of interest in other kinds of benefits. So really what they're asking for is not a specific thing for every type of partnership. It's that the partnership is co-created. It's that we're sitting down together and not making assumptions and really deciding together what this is going to look like. So in each individual case, we can decide together what the benefits might be and what we're looking for. Then a part of our recommendation around, you know, partnerships really being about individuals is that we need to do a lot more to build lots of individuals capacity for partnership. So I think that means things like this, where we're really thinking about, um, you know, providing information and um, reflection opportunities for faculty and community partners and information from research to help each of you be a better partner. But I also think we can think about that in terms of students. Um, Especially if, you know, moving up the development phase, students are more prepared to take on responsibility and design their own projects, then do they know how to engage as an effective partner in the community? And again, thinking about preparation, building in that opportunity for them to learn about what their role in that might be. It's also something we need to think about more, I think, in terms of student life opportunities. So that side of things is where we do see a lot of students guiding their own partnerships through student organizations and that kind of thing and really needing to think about them having a better understanding of what a quality partnership looks like. And then the final one is really exploring other forms of partnership. We did not find a lot of evidence in our study that many community organizations are working with higher education in ways other than student experiences. So most of what the nonprofits talked about was student experiences, whether that's through courses or student organizations or individual student volunteers, that's most of what we're seeing. So therefore, we're not seeing a lot of community-based research partnerships. We're not necessarily seeing a lot of faculty engaging with community organizations as an expert in the field, those kinds of things. Just at least we're not as frequently recognized or mentioned by community organizations. So we think that means there are a lot of untapped opportunities for different kinds of partnerships. So with our findings, I'll just give you a couple more examples. So I would say if you think about what our goal is here, it would be this amazing quote from one of the community partners that was in last year's institute like this, where they really talked about collaboration, communication, and relationships being built from the beginning, and that the final product they got from the class was awesome. Great. Those are both really important things. Happy to see that. Here's what we don't want. This is from a Facebook, a real life Facebook post, by a nonprofit staff member who said that they have a marketing and business class from a local school that requires all five class sessions to go out and do individual marketing or marketing projects for a nonprofit. So hundreds of students individually reaching out to nonprofit organizations in the community, and most of those students are in their first and second years. 
What did we learn yesterday? Can students in their first and second year do that successfully? No, they cannot. So this community partner, first of all, this is coloring how she sees higher education partnerships as a whole. This is coloring whether she will want to work with students at all or be interested in when you approach her with, about your course. So that kind of thing is impacting how all of us might be successful in our partnerships. Um, also, she's saying, we're, we're just saying no to this now. So finally gotten to the point where they're just not doing those kinds of opportunities. So even if you decide you want to continue this type of strategy, um, I think especially in a small community, you're going to quickly run out of organizations interested if they're not finding that that results in something successful for them. So I just uh, point that as a, as a cautionary tale. Um, but to end on a more positive note, I will share some, uh, a couple more concrete examples from past um, institutes. And these are a couple that were recently given awards at our um, Engaged Campus Awards event this past May. So um, last year, two faculty members from the University of Northern Iowa in um, philosophy and religion partnered up together with Embark. So the project involved two separate classes working with each other and with the community organization, which was really cool. They sat down from the beginning and saying, basically, we want to help you think about, we, we just want to help your organization. What do you think your organization needs? And together, they came up with this idea of an English language learner student leadership conference. It was something that Embark had been excited about um, had thought about in the past, but had never thought they would have the capacity to do. So one thing I want to point out about this is that students in one semester came up with the idea and started the planning process, and then it would, was actually implemented by students in another semester. So that's something to think about is projects don't necessarily have to be encompassed in one semester. And, and honestly, if your goals get big enough, they won't be able to. So students can build on each other's work and really continue things. And again, this involved two separate classes. So, you know, lots to coordinate, but it ended up with an incredibly successful project that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, another example is from Co College, a faculty member in psychology who has had a long-standing partnership with Aging Services there, um, where her students work to, they're studying memory and memory loss, and so they're working with this Aging Services Center that is dealing with people in a memory care unit, and they're helping to capture their stories for their families while their memory is declining. So they get to learn a lot about memory and really see that play out with folks, and they've done some research research as well. And um, the, the agency gets something for the people there that their families really value that the agency would not have the capacity to do. So those are two examples that the other thing I would point out is they're not mission critical projects that the organization has to get done. There are things that the organization would love to do but doesn't have the capacity to do. And I in, in my mind, that kind of thing is really a good sweet spot. Because honestly, if it fails or doesn't go as well as they had hoped, it's kind of for the organization like, well, at least we tried because without this, we wouldn't even have tried. Um, and it's not something that's gonna make or break a major grant or a funder relationship or something clients are expecting, right? So it's these additional things where students can really add value and capacity in ways that recognize where they are in their development that they might fail and that that needs to be built in, that needs to be okay because it's a very real possibility when you're talking about people who are learning. Um, but it's also something that if it, if it works even slightly, add something to the organization that they really value but aren't able to do. So um, those are some things I just wanted to point out as really concrete examples. Again, they are, they're two really different examples, right? Because one involves more direct service working with clients to capture their stories and one involves more behind the scenes planning of a conference. Um, so they give you a sense of, of different options. With the conference one, for example, really no need for students to go to the organization. You know, a lot of that can be done very, in very flexible ways and that kind of thing, and students can have a lot of different roles. So just some examples, and again, these both came out of prior institutes. And just having witnessed both of these develop, I also know that in both cases, when they sat down to have their first conversation, 
these projects, how they turned out, is not what either of them was thinking about <laughs> um, when that conversation started. And so I think that's just some of the value of being going in really open, thinking about what are the kinds of things you want, but both sides being open to that changing as you develop new ideas together. So real quick for our faculty members, again, there are a couple important elements of this to be thinking about on your syllabus. One thing I will quickly say, though, too, is that the syllabus should be something you not only share with students, but with the community partner, right? It can really be something that's helpful and that they help to create with you, right? If you want to be explaining their organization, that may be, that's definitely going to be something you want the community partner to see before the students do and help contribute to and that kind of thing. So making sure the partnership is well outlined on the syllabus, that you're really talking about that, um, that you're, again, talking about how those activities align with their learning outcomes, talking about why what you're thinking about doing is important to the community partner, really spelling out all of those things. Um, again, that the project itself is laid out really well so that students understand the role they're going to have from the very beginning, they understand where they're going to do reflection, how they're going to work together, how they're going to work with the community partner, um, that all of those things are, are described well in the syllabus. And then lo the logistical pieces, um, right? So some of this is about communicating clear expectations. Um, so again, some of that preparation of students happens through the syllabus, right? Where you're really communicating what the expectations are gonna be, what the community partner is looking for. And I would also say that's the place where you start that accountability journey with the students, right? Really explaining that um, someone is gonna be counting on you for this and here's what's gonna happen if you don't meet expectations. Um, you know, the reality of that is usually that if you don't meet expectations, your reflection won't be very, very good. You won't, be able to demonstrate the learning that we're looking for and you won't get a very good grade but thinking about other things as well because especially if you know for example there may be group projects where if one or two students don't do very much uh, the community partner isn't really impacted but if it's an individual thing where you're supposed to show up at a specific time you know if um with the the memory example if a family is going to be waiting for you to come and talk to their loved one and tell their story um, and you just plain don't show, there should be pretty significant consequences to that in terms of the, the grade and that kind of thing. So thinking about how you're building all of those things into how you create accountability for students um, so that they understand the higher expectations that this course will have for them. And there are the resources again. So again, I'll send this out to everyone. I think I need to add a link to our study so that you can read that more fully. Um, but otherwise, lots of different things folks can check out. I know you will all be continuing to have conversations this morning on your campus. If there's any, if anybody wants to ask a question, either um, out loud or in the chat box, I'm happy to do that. The format doesn't really lend itself to that super well, so uh, understandable if you just want to have your own conversations. But I will pause for a minute just to see if there's anything folks would like to clarify or mention. And if you guys have anything, I can make sure they hear too. Okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I, I actually did have a question. Sure. Because I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that the concept of, of give and get mm -hmm. is the right one. Yeah. I'm thinking more about like, mouse and and the concept of the gifts which go through Levi Strauss and all, all kinds of other thinkers in which um, both parties are getting a gift yep which I, I I think might put it in this more positive light about sure. oh we're just waiting for you know receive right um, Maybe that's just my own thought about how. Yeah, that's a good way of describing it. About mm -hmm. it. It is a gift on both sides. Yeah, so, so if, if folks can't hear, she's just saying that language that might be useful is thinking about uh, both sides getting a gift through the partnership. And I that is very nice, positive language. Yeah, I like that. Emily, we have a question here in Iowa City. Great. Yes, yesterday you put a slide. You put a slide on the screen yesterday indicating <coughs> different pages of the 
instructor's role in developing a project like this, it seems to me that they might all, all three apply in any given project. Can you talk a little bit about the, those responsibilities and how we could look? Yeah, so the instructor's role is either, a pro, I think it was the student development slide where it's like primary manager, facilitator, coach, and consultant. Is that what you mean? Right. Yeah. yeah I mean, me yeah, sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll just repeat the question. So um, yesterday we had a slide and thinking about at student, at different student development levels, the instructor role shifts. Again, when students are more in their first, second year, it's about being the, really the primary manager of the project, um, moving into more of a facilitator role, moving into more of a con coach and consultant role. Certainly those aren't necessarily um, distinct categories, right? So there may be times where you shift back and forth where you are managing and then doing some coaching as students kind of um, get going. But I would say that it really, what it's trying to point out too, I think is just this idea that of, of how much structure you're providing. Are you really saying, so in my mind in the primary manager role, you're really saying this is the project, this is your role in it. This is what's expected of you and when you're going to do that thing and that kind of thing. And you're really providing a lot more of that sort of project management role and making sure things happen. Moving up to where students can maybe play more of that project management role that they might be able to say, okay, here's the goal. Now I'm going to think about what my steps are and how we get to that. Or we as a group are going to figure out how each of us do that, that kind of thing. So that's some of what it's about is just when do you really need to be hands on providing all the structure versus stepping away a little bit and saying, I will be here to help you work through this, but you're really the one who's guiding how we work through it, if that makes sense. Okay, well, we will leave it there for now. Um, you all will be hearing from me in terms of getting the slides and other resources we've discussed. Please feel free to reach out to me individually with other questions you may have, or if there's something I mentioned sharing that you don't see, um, things along those lines, I'm always happy to do that. Um, again, look for a post survey from me at the end of the semester when you said you would be teaching the course. If, if that changes and the course ends up being a different semester, that's fine. You can let me know either when you think of it or when you get the survey from me or whatever the case may be. Um, but of course, it's very important that we get information after the course about how things went. We're learning a lot from that. Um, that impacts how we plan these sessions. Um, we may also tap you in the future. Uh, we're hoping to, well, we do these every year. And um, if this year seems successful for everyone, we'd love to, again, bring folks from across the three regions together. And uh, we may ask you to come back and talk about what worked and what didn't with your project or that kind of thing. Um, so any feedback about how yesterday and today have gone or what else you recommend is also welcomed. And um, I wish you luck in your projects. I can't wait to see what happens with them. If, before you get the post survey, if your project has um, a product or a news story or anything we could, or even you take some pictures, anything we can share out more broadly to help tell the story of what faculty are doing in this state to impact um, our communities, we try to do quite a bit of that. So also feel free to share those things with me um, because we use them quite a bit. So with that, I will leave you to the rest of your uh, separate days and just, again, wish you luck and thank you for dedicating this amount of time um, to it. And thank you to you and I for hosting us yesterday so graciously and being very helpful in making this happen. So thanks, everyone.